at the 2024 American Physical Society's March meeting. We're exploring the future of physics together. 13,000 researchers and scientists are coming together to connect and collaborate, and APS TV is here to highlight it all. Welcome back once again to the Minneapolis Convention Centre. You're watching APS TV and we're your hosts, Stephen Horn and Audrey Godfrey. Can you believe that we are marking 125 years of the American Physical Society? It's a very special year as we are meeting here in Minneapolis to celebrate the advancement and diffusion of physics. And as we celebrate how far we've come, today we're turning the focus to where we're headed next, the future of physics. What exactly does the upcoming year of quantum science and technology have in store? We find out from those leading the charge. The International Year looks to help make sure that we, we provide equal access to everybody and that everybody has access to the education that they need to build their quantum strategies. And from Texas to Florida, we sit down with students to hear which APS chapters are making the biggest difference on campuses nationwide. Being a part of the student chapters, you get to meet students who are a part of the APS organization. You get to meet students at other institutions. So that just gives you an outlet and ways to solve problems that you see at your eyes. And speaking of campuses, we'll visit colleges and universities today to tour their different physics departments and see how they're paving the way for the future of physics. Our third day has so much in store and there are plenty of ways for you to watch. You can find the latest APS TV episodes airing on the TV screens here at the Minneapolis Convention Center, on the in-house channels at several select partner hotels, on the March Meeting website and on the virtual platform, on the March Meeting app, on our YouTube and X social media channels, or you can scan the QR code here. The year 2025 is a big deal in the physics world. It will mark 100 years since the initial development of quantum physics. So as such, there is a major initiative to mark 2025, the International Year of Quantum Science and Technology. So what would that really mean? Well, Claudia Fracciola and Paul Kadenzimanski are here to explain, Autria, just that. Welcome. Thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us. So Thanks for having us. First question, why now? Uh, in 2025 will be 100 years since the development of quantum mechanics. And uh, for those of us in the physics community and the physical science community in general, uh, quantum mechanics has been a great friend over those 100 years. And we've seen tremendous developments, tremendous growth, and a tremendous future. And so we started talking to people uh, several years ago with basically the pitch of, would you like to have a birthday party 100 years for quantum <laughs> mechanics? And uh, immediately people said yes. We started calling up people all over the world, and we're like, yes, the, quantum's been a great friend. I want to have a 100, 100th birthday party for it. Uh, so that's how it started, and you know, more and more uh, individual people came on board, more and more societies came, came on board, APS took the lead in this, but we have over 60 other uh, societies, institutions all over the world who have been partners in this, and uh, now we have uh, many countries as well who are behind this effort. And we should point out that there is currently a resolution working its way through the United Nations right now to declare 2025 the International Year. Yes. How quickly do we hope that that will be made official? So this is a long process. It started with the UNESCO. So we started working with the UNESCO about a year and a half ago. The UNESCO General Conference that last made approved the resolution and then recommended to the UN to pass a proposition. So right now, the Ghanaian delegation at the UN is working with the Mexican delegation to get the item into the agenda. And we're hoping that it will be sometime in this spring that the year will be declared. We have a lot of technology, a lot of technological innovation at the moment, haven't we? We, we? we hear about quantum all the time, we talk about artificial intelligence. How do we make sure that the benefits of the, the 100th year of quantum are felt by everybody? So this is a very interesting topic and one that you know we're having across and part of the conversations that UN wants us to have, right? Is, is a matter of access, is a matter of supporting the capacity of developing countries to build their own quantum strategies, right? There's many things that 
the quantum will benefit like the health system, the technology, the cryptography development and processing all those things. So how can we guarantee that those countries also have access? You know, there's companies that already are sharing their space time for developing countries to use what exists out there. There's not fully quantum computers, but what exists to start testing it out. So the international year looks to that to help make sure that we, we provide equal access to everybody and that everybody has access to the education that they need to build their quantum strategies. And I would say that you know, the biggest goal of the year is to just generate some awareness about quantum around the world. So in certain countries, uh, in certain societies, like the word quantum is something that might be known. Some people might have some understanding about what that means. But most people around the world have never even heard the word quantum, right? And compare that to what people in, at this conference know. They know how central quantum science is to our understanding of the world around us. Young people are a very key part of enabling a quantum future. How are you making sure to engage with the next generation of quantum researchers? The word quantum actually is well known in popular culture, right? Like last year, I think it was, Quantum Mania, the movie came out. So, the, the younger generation have heard the word, right? And it's a matter of like something idea abstract. What we're trying to do with International Year of Quantum is, you know, build that campaign that connects with people's values on how quantum will really help their communities uh, and their aspirations, career aspirations to reach where they want. Uh, and part of that is how do we demystify the word quantum, right? because there is a lot of misinformation about that word and what it really is. So, so the campaigns that we're trying to build around the International Year is like demystifying that and making feel people comfortable talking about that and not as this abstract, weird thing. It can be an intimidating word. Super intimidating, <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we want to be as friendly as possible, I think. <laughs> These are friendly quantum physics. Yes, yes. yes. Incredible. We look forward to next year and all the excitement to come. Thank yeah. you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We kick off our campus tours at the University of California, Berkeley. At the forefront of quantum computing is UC Berkeley's Challenge Institute for Quantum Computation. Take a look at how the team there is pioneering algorithms and hardware components to build fault-tolerant quantum computers. CIQC is a Challenge Institute for Quantum Computation. It is one of five institutes funded by the National Science Foundation in Quantum Information Science. Our institute specifically addresses the fundamental challenges of developing a quantum computer. We're matching the challenge of the moment by bringing together physicists and mathematicians and computer scientists and chemists and engineers and others and putting them all uh, together in the same space to interact and to um, come up with new research directions to identify the troubles that lie ahead in developing the quantum computer and to try to address them. There's no question that the quantum technology is achievable it, at a large scale that can impact society. Uh, it's just a question of do we get there in five years, 10 years, or 30 years? We are hoping to develop the existing technologies to learn um, how well they can do and where the problems are and ideally come up with actually a better technology which then in the end will lead to a useful fault or run quantum computer. For her incredible research into cell biophysics, Allison Pattison has been named this year's Maria Geppert Meyer Award winner, and we are so thrilled to have her here in studio with us. Congratulations on this award. Thank you very much. It's a big honor. I want to say, like, how does it feel to be awarded by your peers, you know, for your incredible research? It's a big honor, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Awesome. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the focus of the work for which you've been awarded. Tell us a little bit about you know, your cell biophysics research and also what we're looking at here on the screen. Yeah, so our work is in uh, biomechanics and mechanobiology, and we study how cells generate forces and remodel their environment in order to move and other functions. And so one of our big focuses is on the vimentin cytoskeleton, which forms a polymer network inside the cell, which this is a picture of. Um, actually, you can kind of see the circular shape of where the nucleus is. Vimentin is actually closely associated and forms direct linkages to the nucleus. And it's involved in transmitting forces from the cortex of the cell all the way to the cell nucleus. So we're interested in how 
It's involved in uh, nuclear shape and positioning, and we, or some of our work has shown that it acts as a cushion that protects the cell nucleus from damage that can occur when the cell faces really large mechanical forces and a stiff tissue. Incredible, and your research also became important during the recent pandemic. Yes. How did that happen? Well, we were aware that Vimentin was evolved in uh, SARS-CoV-1 host cell invasion. It was kind of a, a bit of an obscure report, but we decided that we would look at its role in SARS-CoV-2 and ultimately found that it was involved in host cell evasion and we could use Vimentin antibodies to block uptake of these SARS-CoV-2 pseudovirus particles. So it's work that um, we're hoping that we can continue and others are, are working on, so we're very excited about it. That's amazing. Uh, so that's just one example of the type of impact that your research has. Can you elaborate on some other type of impacts that you know, you've found? So we've also, Vimentin's involved in a host of different diseases. So for instance, right now we're also thinking about how Vimentin relates to inflammation, uh, which drives many different diseases, yeah. What do you enjoy most about the work that you do? I love that it's an interdisciplinary area and I get to bring creativity to the project. Um, there's not just one way that we can solve a problem, and I also love working with students and getting to see them grow and shine. What would your advice be to somebody who's just getting into the field? Um, I would say to seek out good mentorship, so having really supportive people around you and mentors that can help um, guide you and your interests and how they fit into a larger field is very helpful. Well, thank you so much for your time today, and again, congratulations on your award. Thank you. Now to Northwestern. At the Center for Fundamental Physics at Northwestern University, they utilize novel quantum devices and methods along with cutting edge technology to make highly precise measurements that can be realized on tabletops without the need for large national or international facilities. The standard model of particle physics is a collection of particles, interactions, and symmetries that, within the mathematical framework of quantum field theory, provide our best description of physical reality. The mission of the Center for Fundamental Physics at Northwestern University, the CFP for short, is to make highly precise measurements to test the standard model and unusually sensitive searches for new physics that is beyond the standard model. The students, postdocs, and professors of the CFP utilize novel quantum devices and methods, along with cutting-edge technologies to perform measurements that fit on tabletops without the need for large national or international facilities. It is time for one of the most exciting parts of the APS March meeting, hitting the exhibit hall to see how corporations and companies are making quantum tech a reality. We chose here at the APS March meeting 2024 to make a world first, which is the first ever working quantum computer on a conference floor. This is a Deluxe refrigerator, which produces temperatures down as low as about five millikelvin to enable quantum computing. We're showing a cabling system or a wiring solution for quantum computers. We've got a lot of openings on our team. You know, we're looking to recruit people from the APS meeting. The maturity is really progressing. And what we do here today shows that quantum technology is becoming a value chain. That it's not just about building one system, but building many pieces of the puzzle that together make a quantum system. Because this is still an early stage industry, um, there's a lot of that fundamental research that's got to happen. It is really a developing technology, but we're seeing major breakthroughs coming. Even in these early days, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of very quick growth, and it's really a pleasure to be a part of such a, a rapidly maturing industry. I'm most excited about uh, building a fault-tolerant quantum stack. So it means that a quantum computer can correct its own errors. That's the real way towards uh, making economically viable quantum systems. Being at Google, I'm most excited about quantum computing, and I think there are some really exciting applications in like the sustainability clean energy space for quantum computers, designing better batteries, modeling fusion energy so that we can make fusion energy a reality. I'm actually excited that it's a race, and you see one going ahead, and then the other one, and then the other one. There's not really a choice being made yet, and that's quite cool actually. What I'm most excited about are some of the promising technologies, the applications, 
and being able to be part of the group that's enabling these uh, technologies. The next, I think, stage for the quantum computing industry is to address errors, which are a big problem in quantum computing, error correction, and that's really the big focus for our team. We're focused on building what we call a long-lived logical qubit. But these systems are not powerful enough yet for a practical, economically viable application. So to get there, it's a gradual process, but in the coming three, five, ten years, we'll make huge leaps towards uh, these economical, viable solutions. If we look at the current pricing of qubits, and, and all the, the hardware you need for it is really expensive. This has to come down. You see this in all the talks, you see this all the people talking about that. But I think in order to make uh, quantum technology mature and, and good for the industry, it, it has to come down. And I think that's, that's what we're all working on. So. There are a number of breakthroughs that are needed. The fundamental science has been proven out, but the engineering of scaling, trying to get the, uh, the growth to the number of qubits that are needed, the entire stack needs to mature and, and there's a lot of development that needs to be done along the way. The APS March meeting is really the biggest one, where the people gather who bring the field uh, ahead. The Department of Physics at the University of Limerick in the Republic of Ireland is a relatively new department, only established in 1994. Since then, the department has remained at the forefront of Ireland's drive on research and education for people and society. The Department of Physics came into existence in 1994 uh, with the emphasis on uh, fundamental questions in relation to magnetic semiconductor and uh, biomedical devices. Uh, and as such, you know, uh, we started as a physics department tackling fundamental issues that relates to uh, real-day applications. It's a very research active department uh, with a lot of teaching faculty and our researchers collaborate a lot with industry as well as working with research groups around the country and around the world. I think we, we have the foundation uh, we have to create a platform from where we can now continue on uh, a lot of disruptive innovation and outstanding ideas that will shape our future. The magnetic mirror is the simplest form of steady magnetic confinement and centrifugal rotation at supersonic speeds makes it a promising fusion reactor candidate for its stability, engineering simplicity and expected affordability with respect to other fusion concepts. Let's take a look at how the centrifugal mirror fusion experiment at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County is working to increase stability at thermonuclear conditions. The centrifugal mirror fusion experiment was set up to test models and theories that have been created over the years. And the purpose is to test these theories that predict that the centrifugal mirror concept can be a net energy gain fusion machine. The centrifugal mirror experiment is a magnetic mirror or a magnetic bottle or trap, you could say. And what makes this different is that we're using an electrode that's placed down the center axis to cause an E cross B drift to get the plasma to rotate. I'm excited about the future because I see the results we are getting right now are showing that there is a path to a reactor. It's an exciting time for everyone because there's also more generalized interest and more appetite for investment, which gives us the support and tools that we need to continue onto a bigger machine to actually get to the end goal of demonstrating net energy gain. The APS chapters support graduate students, postdocs, and early career scientists. Take a listen now to how the various APS chapters take a unique approach to specific issues at their institutions to focus on what is most important to their members. Our chapter is American Physical Society chapters at the University of Houston. It looked like a really good opportunity for networking uh, and then, you know, like support each other as a graduate student. I am the chair of the University of Central Florida APS chapter. My friends asked me to be a part of it, and I said, um, no thanks, I'm too busy. I'm so glad that I just said, okay, finally. I am the vice chair at our chapter at the University of Central Florida. Joining the APS chapter gave us outside connections in the APS organization to come together and find new solutions to solve these problems for the grad students at UCF. 
as an APS chapter, we would get help from other chapter members as well. So we could go beyond our own university. They, they didn't give us a list of things that need to be done. Um, it's more up to the problems that your institution faced. They have the backing of APS to help uh, fund uh, whatever projects they need or give them ideas, introduce them to other people. For our chapter, everyone is involved. Everyone feels part of a community. And then we get a lot of diverse ideas which will cater to everyone's needs. The Physics Research Day, it's uh, hosted by the Department of Physics from Univ University of Houston, but it's a large event. They wanted somebody who could reach out to the student community uh, directly. It was a perfect opportunity for us to organize different things, develop our leadership roles. They are student-led and it's by your interest or your school's needs or your student body needs. And what we sort of ended up doing for our school is advocacy work. For us, we want to work on the uh, grad compensation. So we did surveys for the students at our institution. The survey actually went to the APS organization and it actually became one of the action items that they wanted to push at the CVD for 2024. Our very first congressional visit day was just virtual or phone calls, right? But once you go to Congress and once you walk in those halls, it becomes such a bigger thing. So we were able to do that for the first time in 2023. Being a part of the student chapters, you get to meet students who are a part of the APS organization. You get to meet students at other institutions. So that just gives you an outlet and ways to solve problems that you see at your uh, institution. So I would not be in graduate school if it weren't for APS and the bridge program. And so that has worked well for me. And then it just so happens I fell into chapters. And so every step along the way, APS has been there for us. You would get so many opportunities, not just in the university, but beyond the university. So I would encourage everyone to join APS Cap. The WITS Quantum Initiative is a strategic initiative of the University of Witswatersrand to be a driver of quantum technologies, making WITS the leading quantum institute in Africa. The WITS Quantum Initiative, WITSQ, is to try and take quantum science out of the traditional school of physics into all departments and faculties across the university. Ultimately, we hope to see quantum science transition to quantum technology. That means evolving from basic physics of quantum mechanics to economists using quantum computers. Quantum technologies are technologies of the future, and I think it's important that leading institutions on the African continent, like that, get involved in its early stage and have the advantage of the first mover. We have a national quantum strategy that we are driving from WITS. And the second is more inward looking, WITS Q, to get academics involved in this quantum future. What we want to do is train a future quantum workforce and to have a quantum economy waiting to employ them. The University of Tennessee at Chattanooga has launched an institutional initiative in quantum information science and engineering. Let's see how they are achieving their goal of establishing a program known for excellence in education, innovation and economic development enabled by quantum technology. The Quantum Initiative was started around the time when EPB with Cubitec decided to deploy the first phase of the commercial quantum network here in the downtown area. The focus of UTC's Quantum Initiative has twofold. One, to create a collaborative research environment. Two, to create the pipeline of educating a quantum-ready workforce. We're super excited about the future of the quantum initiative at UTC for really three reasons. One is the resonance with our students is already there. We've been able to attract new talent to come into the university and into the community. And we're making progress with demonstrating use cases for quantum technology. So the future is bright. We're going to stand up a quantum center and it'll be sustainable.
Stephen, as we are highlighting all of these college campuses, it got us thinking, what is it like to be a student right now in the world of physics? Well, believe it or not, Audra, I can answer that for <laughs> you. <laughs> but with the help of some friends, of course, William and Haley help us to get a better understanding of the March meeting experience. Hi, I'm William Menizzi, attending uh, APS March meeting from Arizona State University. And I'm Haley Curry, and I'm coming from the University of Texas at Austin. This is my first March meeting, and I'm really excited to present on Wednesday. I study biofilm mechanics with Dr. Vernita Gordon, but I'm graduating this semester, so I'm excited to see what my next step will be. Okay, okay, interesting. Uh, so I'm, my research lies on the intersection of quantum computing and high energy physics. Great, that's a big field right now. I'm really excited to meet professionals in my field and get a better perspective on what's going on in biological physics since that's my next step. Okay. How about you? I'm just excited to meet more people who are like-minded and interested in science. Great, well, let's go check it out. Absolutely. I'm about to head into Collective Behaviors in Biology too, and I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to this session. That was a great session. I learned a lot about how ants swarm together and also how bees collectively move together to thermoregulate. See you later. I'm gonna head back over here towards the physics membership booth where I'll be working as a student ambassador, trying to promote uh, involvement in APS and uh, making sure our students here know of the opportunities that are available. If you'd like to go on that board behind you, take one of those dab pens and maybe indicate which country you currently live in. We're at the DBIO membership table. We've got a raffle running for some super cool shirts. We also have some fun DBIO swag. This is a picture of min proteins grown on a lipid membrane. We're just sort of advertising the Division of Biological Physics. This is my first time volunteering, so I'm having a great time. So I just finished my talk uh, in the focus session that was on quantum error correction and entanglement. I was extremely nervous when I went up there, but as usual, uh, once you get up there, it's very exciting. Uh, it's very interesting to see all the people that are there to, to appreciate your work. Uh, and I had a really good time. We got some excellent questions at the end. So I'm feeling good now. I'm finally feeling a bit relaxed and ready to enjoy the rest of the conference. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm doing well. How was your conference so far? It's been excellent. I've been really enjoying it. The meeting overall has been excellent. I've had a wonderful chance to speak with people from different countries, from different organizations, from industry to academia, and it's really been an excellent experience overall to just uh, enjoy sharing the love of science with people. My meeting has been great. I've really enjoyed seeing all the sessions and talking to people, especially being able to present work, which is a big part of being a professional in science in the future. I'm going to enjoy the student reception with all the other students here and it uh, sounds like we're playing a game. Quantum computing has the potential to completely change our world. Let's see how Indiana University's Quantum Science and Engineering Center is already preparing the quantum workforce that the future demands. Quantum computing has the opportunity to change just about everything we do in the world today. We have to make sure that everybody who has the ability to contribute to this enterprise gives an opportunity to do so. We have people from multiple fields collaborating on inventing new quantum technologies. So when a grad student comes to work with us in my lab, they will be exposed to multiple fields and projects that cross-cut in those fields. The center really is devoted towards supporting the successful careers of young researchers. We're preparing the future for the next generation of our quantum workforce. The heart of what we're trying to do here at QSEC is bringing people together from different disciplines to work on a single problem. That cross-disciplinary action is what's really important. We finish up today's tour by stepping into the world of quantum exploration at Florida State University, where cutting edge research is driving innovation in quantum science and engineering. 
Here at Florida State University, we are really committed to being a world-leading powerhouse in research in areas that build on the strong foundation of the faculty who are already here. The National High Magnetic Field Laboratory is sponsored by the National Science Foundation Division of Materials Research. And as a result, our users, many of our users come here to perform research on quantum materials. So I think this quantum initiative is just going to strengthen our world-leading reputation in this area of research. Within the nearest two, three years, we plan to hire eight new faculty members uh, across colleges of arts and sciences and engineering and uh, across departments. Uh, and they'll be in both quantum science uh, theory and uh, experiments. We need to have a um, very well-designed, uh, focused educational program. We would like to see that we have many more students pursuing this area because it's so important and one thing that we substantially lack and not only at FSU I think across the nation is qualified workforce. They're going to also bring their own ideas and their own perspectives and their imagination is the only thing that will limit where this can go. Well, also, unfortunately, that brings my time here to a close. Regrettably, my plane back across the pond is leaving earlier than I'd like, but there's still more APS TV to come. Off to interview more Nobel laureates, I certainly hope. Stephen may be wrapping up, but our coverage of the APS March meeting rolls on. In fact, Autria, all our coverage is always on. You can find the latest APS TV episodes airing on the TV screens here at the Minneapolis Convention Center, on the in-house channels at several select partner hotels, on the March Meeting website and on the virtual platform, on the March Meeting app, on our YouTube and X social media channels, or you can scan the QR code right here. Well, Stephen, it has been such a pleasure. Safe travels, and I do hope that we get to talk physics together again next year. I will be right back here again tomorrow for our fourth day of APS TV. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and have a great one.